Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first episode of a new series uh, that will loosely be titled uh, Win a Championship in Name of Game with Name of Team. In this case, of course, win a Super Bowl in Madden 2001 with the Tennessee Titans. Now, why the Titans? Well, I mean, if you look at the box, Eddie's on the cover. Um, that's really it. This being the first episode of the series, I kind of wanted something not easy per se, but you know, something that can give a good example of where I'm not like trying to have to do this for like eight seasons before I have an actually competitive team. The Titans in this game are a very good team. They are one of the more interesting teams in the game. They have uh, Steve McNair at quarterback, Eddie George, uh, Javon Curse. They had just come off of a Super Bowl appearance, and a lot of people penned them to be the best team in the AFC in 2000, and that includes a lot of the players in uh, the AFC at that time. Uh, I remember long ago I used to watch those old uh, NFL films like season documentaries, uh, season yearbooks, uh, and one of them was for <clears throat> the 2000 Baltimore Ravens when they won the Super Bowl, and there was a particular moment when like, uh, when one of my favorite coaches ever, uh, Brian Billick, gets up on a table after they beat the Titans in Tennessee and says, now I'll be honest with you, a lot of people say the Titans are the best team in the AFC, and I think so too, possibly. But not today, and you know they won that game. So, Titans are the NFL's best team. Maybe they are, but not today. And they ended up winning the Super Bowl and beat the Titans in the playoffs. So this is sort of an, uh, you know, maybe an attempt to reverse the tide of uh, that 2000 season, get a championship to Tennessee. In only the uh, fourth year of the Titans being in Tennessee, and only the second year of them being the Titans, that's one of the more fascinating things about this team is how quickly they were able to become a great NFL team, these Titans. So we're going to see what we can do. We got a great offensive line, one of the best in history. We got a great running back uh, in his prime, a great quarterback, and you know, a pretty stout defense. Maybe not the best. That's definitely the weakest part of this team uh, if there is a really solid weakness. So we'll see what we can do. We start out a week one in Buffalo against the Bills to kind of uh, repeat what was one of the more uh, interesting playoff games of the previous season in Nashville, the famous uh, Music City Miracle between the Bills and Titans. This one takes place in New York, so we get off a start in week one in West New York. Out is Jeff Fisher, before he was terrible. Uh, this was back when he was good, and uh, back before he got fired, which was this year. In is Bones Jarvis. Head coach extraordinaire with a random body type. I don't remember what I gave him, but we are coming to you from Ralph Wilson Stadium, or at least a virtual amalgamation of Ralph Wilson Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. Uh, I got that right. It is not exactly Buffalo. It's one of those places where you put it in the old uh, suburb and just call it the name of the big city, because that's what people really remember. We got Carl Pickens. We got Eddie George. We got our man, Steve Air McNair coming at you, taking on the Bills. The 2000 Bills, not a great team. They were coming off of a playoff loss to the Tennessee Titans in 1999, a really good 99 season uh, where they, you know, made the playoffs, but lost in the first round on a uh, kind of crazy play, if you don't remember. It was called the Music City Miracle. Uh, they had the lead all the way up until the end. Well, they got the lead back at the end, then Tennessee basically took it from them by uh, with, with a ridiculous kickoff return play classic moment in NFL history. They've gotten their starting quarterback, Rob Johnson, who is really the reason why this team is, uh, how should we say, not good. Because the Buffalo Bills in 2000 did one of the dumbest things that any team has ever done, which is uh, take, take, let's say you have two quarterbacks, one of them is good, and uh, one of them is bad. Which one do you pick? You'd pick the good one, you'd think, but the Buffalo Bills... Having Doug Flutie, a guy who statistically made the rest of his team better, and uh, Rob Johnson, a game, a guy who just was not good, who was just mediocre, but they paid a lot more money for Rob Johnson. There was front office pressure to start Rob Johnson, and start Rob Johnson they did, and lose games they did, because that's what happens when you play the worst player. 
I don't understand. Uh, yeah, okay. What What's going to sell more tickets, having a garbage quarterback or winning games? I don't know. Uh, you tell me, Buffalo, uh, and whenever the last time you made it to the playoffs was. Eddie George breaks a 56-yard run from scrimmage there. The key thing to know about Eddie is his resilience. He just doesn't go down until the last possible moment. We got Lorenzo Neal, one of the best fullbacks of the era, on a very good Tennessee Titans team, taking the handoff from Steve McNair and getting into the end zone to take a 7-3 lead here in the first quarter. But you know what? For his credit, as bad as he was, and he was bad, people called him Robosack because he uh, held on to the ball for way too long and just didn't get the ball out, and so he would get sacked a lot. Uh, he, you know, Rob Johnson moves the team down the field here in this virtual game. However, they don't get into the end zone. He cannot deliver the ball right there, and they're forced to kick another field goal. So instead of taking a 10-7 lead, they take a 7-6 lead. And uh, to make matters worse, Doug Flutie's right there holding the ball uh, as it is kicked. Now, if you're starting a franchise in Men 2001 and you don't have a good quarterback, just try to go get Doug Flutie because he's going to be a backup. The Bills don't want him, and uh, he's probably better than most of the other quarterbacks in this game. And the reasoning behind that is that he is an accurate thrower, uh, or accurate passer, rather, I shouldn't say thrower, and he is the fastest quarterback in the game. So he has a level to his game that nobody else really has. And one level to Aldo Greco's game that nobody has, or that Aldo Greco specifically has, is a very weak a very weak leg, average size leg at best, could not get like a 40 yard field goal through the uprights. Of course, I guess I could have been slightly better on that, but still that doesn't even get it past, uh, past the end zone, so that would have been no good either way, but we do get the interception to make up for it. We're trying to run with Steve McNair, we get one guy to miss. Steve McNair is not a fast quarterback, his biggest issue is uh, acceleration. When you get him to his top speed, he can run pretty fast, but when you just kind of start him running, he's not a great scrambler. You have to have like an open lane for him to go. This is a good example. He gets caught behind uh, Bruce Matthews right here and goes down. By the way, Bruce Matthews, one of the best offensive linemen on one of the best offensive lines in this game. We have two pro bowlers uh, on the left side. We have Bruce Matthews and uh, a man whose name I have since forgotten. So the run game for the Titans works well because you have a great running back in Eddie George, a guy who can take hits and keep running, and then you also have a great offensive line specifically on the left side, but even the entire offensive line is above average. So this is a better running team, the Tennessee Titans. The Buffalo Bills would be a better passing team, you'd think. We get them, by the way, this is the end of the game, fourth quarter, third and goal. We stop them there, stop Antoine Smith, and so they go back. They have an open Eric Moulds in the end zone, but Robosack overthrows them. So, Titans have a 17-3 lead. They did get a touchdown. I didn't show the touchdown, I don't think, uh, unfortunately. So I haven't shown you exactly what happened to this game. Steve McNair does take the knee, though, and the Titans win their first game in Buffalo, going into a hostile environment after a pretty decent defensive showing from the Bills. We just had a better run game and a better pass game overall, so it's both uh, facets of the offense better than what Buffalo had, which, uh, that, you know, that kind of computes to a win. Our second game takes place at home in Nashville, Tennessee. Taking on my hometown, Kansas City Chiefs. The 2000 Kansas City Chiefs. We're in a little bit of a rough spot in a weird period. This is during the Gunther Cunningham era, which didn't last too long because he notoriously underachieved with a pretty decent Chiefs defense. Within about three or four years, this team would be almost completely overhauled for the Dick Vermeil era. This was kind of the dregs, the last guys who were hanging on after that great Marty Schottenheimer era of the mid-90s. You had your Elvis Gerbax, uh, Kimball Anders, I think Andre Risen was on that team. And there are a lot of good players on that team, but this team was not a playoff team, and they were not a playoff caliber team either. However, we're coming off of a win. We need to establish a ground game against a really good Kansas City Chiefs defensive line. That was probably the best thing they had that season. They had Chester McLaughlin before we kind of figured out he was bad. And uh, really a very talented defense, uh, even though it wasn't quite the same defense that was there in 97, 98, even though, you know, extenuating circumstances, uh, Neil Smith leaving, uh, the tragic death of uh, Derek Thomas, and uh, all sorts of things like that. 
We return. Well, we don't really return. We just go home for the first time this season here in the second game to take on the Chiefs of Kansas City out of the AFC West. The 2000 Chiefs, as I said, not a great team. Really kind of bad to mediocre team. The first season of Gunther Cunningham, the very short-lived uh, Gunther Cunningham era in Kansas City. He was sort of a disciple of Marty Schottenheimer. He was a good defensive coach, coached a bunch of good defensive teams. But like I said, this is not the defensive team of 1998. Even though they do have some good players, they got Patton there getting the interception on uh, on Steve McNair. I wanted this to be a like a perfect year for Steve McNair. Uh, I was because I was so focused on running the ball, I was like, oh, I'm only going to use Steve McNair sparingly, and I won't have any interceptions because they'll never see me throwing the ball coming. Because it'll just be giving the ball to Eddie. Because that's what you got to do when you have a great offensive line and a great running back who sometimes I uh, run way too far backwards and lose a ton of yarns with. McNair, here I go to Dyson, who drops the ball. Reminder, every time Kevin Dyson drops the ball, we are reminded that he was drafted before Randy Moss, at about 10 picks before Randy Moss, uh, which is a, a goddamn crime. It is 0-0 zero to zero at the end of the first quarter. This, uh, oh, spoiler alert, not a high-scoring game. A defensive struggle between two very good defensive lines. I criticize the Chiefs... Uh, defensive line here were really the Chiefs defense in general but they had a good defensive line their big problem was they just didn't have the linebackers they used to and they had such good linebackers in particular Derek Thomas I know you know nobody's fault that Derek Thomas you know, died but it's still just not as good of a team as they were in 1998 or 1997 without uh, without really the the better defense they do have Pete Stojanovic though a legend in Kansas City uh, for the time he played there just because he wasn't uh, Lynn Elliott because Lynn Elliott was abject garbage. Kevin Dyson making the grab right there, getting past the 40-yard line, so kind of redeeming that drop he had earlier on. Steve McNair, I go over the middle of the Yancey Thigpen. I think Yancey Thigpen was a former Chief. I know he was a former a Pittsburgh Steeler, but I don't remember any other places he played. McNair getting into the end zone on the scramble there. Like I said... McNair is not a good scrambler behind the line of scrimmage. You will get sacked with him if you try to scramble behind the line. If you can get him in front, though, he has a slow acceleration but a high top speed. Um, I don't know what to really compare him to. He's like driving a truck, kind of, in that way. I, I've never driven a truck, though, so I can't really tell you that. And uh, Anyway, <laughs> we have Elvis Gerback who goes to the end zone, throwing one of them perfect. Elvis Gerback passes... That flies far right of the receiver he was going for. Elvis Gerback wearing 18. If you remember 98, he wore number 11. He, uh, they chose to stick with Elvis rather than going with um, a guy they thought was washed up, beaten down, an old veteran, I think, of the CFL named, uh, you know, he never went on to do anything again. His name was uh, Rich Gannon. They went with Elvis Gerback. Uh, you know, Rich got him to, uh, Rich got, rather, the Raiders to a Super Bowl. Uh, Elvis Gerbach got the Chiefs to like a 4 and 12 record in 2000 and pretty much we, you know he was fine for a couple of years this is well past the era where he was fine but this game we were done and first of all Javon Kirst just destroys Elvis Gerbach right there kind of cathartic for Chiefs fans I think and then Gerbach looking to the left finds Kimball Andrews and I should say Kimball Andrews destroyed our defense this game playing way above the level of the actual Kimball Andrews who was a fine Fine player. Sydney thinking you might call that the game-winning interception, the game-saving interception. I thought that at the time. Because, of course, we got two and a half minutes to burn, and we got the best back in the game who uh, gets tackled right there. Just destroys the Glock, Chester, McGlo Chester McLaughlin, who was kind of overpaid in Kansas City. He was a fine player. Not uh, He had a huge contract after he had a bunch of good years in Oakland. Just not that good in KC. I think he was a little bit past his prime, maybe. Had a little bit of that uh, Hainsworth syndrome, as he would call that. They go over the middle to Alexander. He was the other guy who was really killing us in this game. Tony Gonzalez drops the pass, but he's looking for the flag. Tony, I'm sorry. That was your bad, though. Our guy on the left, I think that's Alexander, can't hold on to the ball. That might be Andre Risen, though. Elvis Gerback again goes to Tony. Again, misfires. Can't hit him. Eddie gets the first down right there. Just slamming. God, is that is that Greg Wesley to the ground? I don't know. I couldn't tell you anybody, really, on the 2000 Chiefs. You get me to 2003, I can do most of them. That's the end of the game. Defensive struggle. Hardly an confidence-inspiring performance, though. 
The next game we go to Pittsburgh and play in Three Rivers Stadium. That's right, Three Rivers Stadium. I couldn't actually believe it when I was playing the game because I thought they had been in Heinz Field like all throughout this decade, all throughout this era. So the, the Three Rivers Stadium I associate so much with like the late 70s and the early 80s. It's so bizarre to see it represented on a PlayStation 2, something that's like from my era, from my, um, from my childhood effectively. So it's like a weird itch between time, between the 70s and 2000. This was the last year they spent in uh, Three River Stadium, they'd be at Heinz Field the next year, but still kind of interesting to see. These Steelers were actually very talented. They had Cordell Stewart at quarterback kind of before his sort of collapse in the 2002-2003 season. Uh, Tommy Maddox at this point would have still been in the XFL, or uh, this was probably actually pre-XFL for him. Uh, they had a lot of good uh, defensive talent. They had the Joey Porter before he was... Um, Really the best that he was, but he was still showing some good signs. And of course, you had the bus, Jerome Bettis, in Pittsburgh. So, we take the Titans up there to see how we do in what was at that time an AFC Central clash. Uh, remember, these two teams were in the same division for a really pretty good span of time. Uh, ever since there was the Houston Oilers and Pittsburgh Steelers in the 80s, you know, with, uh, with God, what was his name? Jerry Glanville. There we go. I don't know why I had to for, uh, remember the name Jerry Glanville with the Oilers. And of course, the Steelers. At this point, still kind of the Steelers in the 90s, before the great Steelers in the mid-2000s, still, so still sort of that transitionary period. So, interesting game between two interesting teams. Very much, though, a, uh, you, you expect this to be a ground-heavy and defensive-heavy game, which, you know, it turns out to We head to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of uh, people pronouncing the team name Stiller, like with an I, calling people uh, Jagoff, and uh, putting potatoes on sandwiches, as you do in the city of Pittsburgh, Pierogies, I think, are a thing there. I don't know that much about the city of Pittsburgh. I'm sure it's a fine place to live, though. No disrespect to the Pittsburgh people or to either Carnegie or Mellon or any of the other things I know about the city of Pittsburgh or Joey Porter. Actually, you know what, Joey Porter, we got a little bit of a bone to pick because of uh, that play right there. However, Steve McNair got a bigger bone to pick because he can't connect the pass to Carl Pickens and then out El Greco with his tiny little leg child-sized leg, kicking like a high schooler, missing the field goals, Heinz Ward, Satan incarnate, as we called him during the day because he was just so damn good, and Jerome Bettis, the bus, as we called him, who fumbles right there, picked up by Robertson. So, what was a bad offensive drive, and then really not a great defensive drive, ends up being saved by a turnover. That's how you do it. We got a wide open Yancey Thigpen right there on the right side. Really, this team is combined, is, is really the combination of a bunch of good guys. There's no Hall of Fame, no great receiver really here. We do have a great running back. He's really the, the, the cornerstone of this team. And then you got Bruce Matthews, a I think a Hall of Fame uh, offensive lineman as well, one of the best. But other than that, you had a great quarterback and then a bunch of really good receivers. Not great guys, though. You don't have a Randy Moss, but you got a Kevin Dyson who was pretty good. You have a Yancey Thigpen who was pretty good. And you got a Carl Pickens who was pretty good. And then you've also got Frank Wycheck, the tight end, who was really good for a period of time. There's a store at the mall near where I live that has just a selection of Frank Wycheck jerseys still in stock because they ordered way too many of them back in 2000. You can go buy them for like 10 bucks a pop if you want a Frank Wycheck jersey and live in the Kansas City metro area. However... I should probably commentate on the game. They go for a punt here. Miller there. Normally I don't show punts, but look at how long this punt is. We call that luck. Some may call that skill. Regardless, we go to Eddie George here who gets us the first down because that's all he does is get first downs. Just get yards. Steve McNair running right there. I know I've kept saying not to scramble with him and then I kept doing it because sometimes it works. It does work sometimes. He's more mobile than like a Peyton Manning or like an Elvis Gerbach. And uh, Kima Von Olhoffen recovering the fumble right there. Anybody remember him? He was uh, the guy who broke Carson Palmer's leg, even though inadvertently. We go to Heinz Ward, who makes the catch right there. Heinz Ward was just so damn good and so damn hard to like if you were a fan of anybody who wasn't uh, the Steelers. Now, for Steeler fans, he was a great player, and he was a great player. I mean, let's not, let's not get it twisted here. He was great, but just people genuinely disliked him for some reason. Anyway, Cordell Stewart connects with him in the end zone and ties the game up right before half, and they get the ball back at half. We receive to start the game out, except Isaac Bird gets the good kickoff return. Where'd he go to college? 
we go over the middle to Kevin Dyson who makes the reception and he scores so you know what sometimes you can mess up and sometimes it just gets right back to you all you need is a little bit of luck and the breaks did go the Titans way in this game it's 14 to 7 at the end of the second and then we get the Steelers I think to a three and out I don't show it here we get the ball back in the third quarter give it to Eddie who gets us the first down that's just what you do when you get a first down third and five this is a quarterback draw play actually that I run with Steve McNair and get the first down there on the dive then I'm moving Kevin Dyson over to the right side. The controller, there's a weird thing Madden 2001 does where sometimes it just assumes you want to use the right analog stick to throw the ball, and you never do because that's a horrible way to do things. Aldo Greco, though, I have to eat my words about him. Should have eaten my words about Kevin Dyson as well. I called him bad in the last video, but you know what? Or I'm sorry, not in the last video, in the last segment, but he got a touchdown there. Pittsburgh Steelers kicker right here. He's going to make a long field goal, like a line drive. That would have been good from about 15 yards more back, I'm willing to bet. Give it to Eddie, though. All they got to do is stop Eddie George. And guess what you can't do is stop Eddie George because he's just too damn good. We give it to him right at the goal line. We score. 24-10 to 10 is the final score, showing up the fans, the Stiller fans here in Pittsburgh. I was going to say Pittsburgh, but I know that's like a New York thing. Regardless... We win. We improve to 3-0 and on the season. What a great way to start. For the fourth game in this video, and of course the final game of this video, we head back home to Nashville to take on the New York Giants. Now, longtime viewers, if there are any of you, may remember the series I did in mid-2014, where I played as a, in Madden 2002, effectively with the New York Giants, even though there was a weird team creation mode I used to put them in Los Angeles. It was a whole long story. I don't expect anybody to actually remember this, but for that reason, I know a lot of the uh, tendencies of the 2000 to 2001 Giants, the team that did go to the Super Bowl, of course, lost and lost handily. But a team uh, held by Kerry Collins, they had Tiki Barber, uh, Amani Toomer, a lot of good, I think Jesse Armstead on defense, and Michael Strahan, famously, I don't know why I brought up Jesse Armstead beforehand, but they had, you know, Ike Hilliard, uh, a lot of talented players, very good team, a Super Bowl team, I mean, the NFC Championship team, but uh, in this game, well, let's say we get into a little bit of a shootout. And we are back home in Nashville, or whatever suburb of Nashville this is. Taking on the Giants, their starting run Dane at running back, back when he was a rookie, back when he had promise. Kind of a bust run Dane, but he had a Heisman Trophy, had a great, uh, great college career, just not a very good NFL one. Eddie George, the guy we give it to to start off with, he is our Alpha and our Omega versus our fallen angel, our Lucifer, Steve McNair, who throws the interception right there, but he does get redeemed right back at the end, just as, uh, the, well, I haven't read Paradise Lost in a couple of weeks. Anyway, uh, we give it to Greg Camella right there. This is fitting. I feel like this is karma, even maybe, given the amount of verbal abuse I heaped on our garbage fullback, Greg Camella, during that, uh, that franchise I ran in 2015. Give it to Eddie George, who gets the touchdown right there. So we tie it right back up at 7-7 seven to seven here in the fourth quarter. This is a shootout, a good, old-fashioned Nashville shootout. I don't know if they had shootouts in Nashville. Also, it's a running game based shootout because I keep giving it to Eddie George. We get a quick 21-7 lead right before the half, and at half it is 21-7. But don't count the Giants out. Never count the Giants out, as I come to learn here. Kerry Collins from the 21-yard line finds Amani Toomer, and that's a touchdown. See, the big issue with this year's Giants team is that they are hard to stop because they've got Toomer and Hilliard on the outside, both guys who are incredibly fast. you got Kerry Collins, a guy who, if he throws like three good passes a game, will get three touchdowns because he's got such good receiving talent the way they do. They had a great defense at the time, too. They had Michael Strahan. There's no wonder they made it to the Super Bowl. They were a good team. But... Eddie George gets to him today. That, I believe, is Eddie George's fourth touchdown. He's racking up some yards today. We got Kerry Collins, a guy who was a little bit of a racist and who finds uh, Bishop there for the Titans, who gets a little bit of a good return on this. He gets past the 50-yard line, and so forced him to throw off his back foot under pressure, 28-14 to 14 at the end of the third. But we are not done here, ladies and gentlemen. That's not even resemblant of what the final score is. I call like three audibles on this play trying to draw the Giants to some mistake or something, trying to mess him up. I don't, so I end up going to the pass, and guess who we find? We find Kevin Dyson, the guy I said was horrible like two games ago. 
I'm calling him good now because as it turns out, he's just good. So he's not our number one guy. Carl Pickens is our number one guy, and I just don't give it to him for that often for whatever reason. I kind of want us to try to start finding him some more, uh, just like Ike Hilliard. Another guy who killed me, he was my favorite guy when I was playing a, a franchise with the Giants two years ago. Was it two years ago or one year ago? I think that was one year ago. Anyway, I think it was last summer. Regardless, I kill you getting the touchdown there. I don't even plan for the onside kick, and Bruce Matthews picks it up. Thank you, Bruce. That's why you're in the Hall of Fame right there. That's not why you're in the Hall of Fame. We give it not to Eddie. Broken play. Perfectly picked up by the Giants, but they don't control. What was I saying about acceleration and top speed? You get McNair out in the open field, and he can kill you, and he'll dance on you in the end zone. I believe that's 30 points, 35 points, rather, for the Tennessee Titans. Celebrating right in the referee's face. <laughs> Kerry Collins going to the right side. Finds Dixon there, so they do score there. So that's, what, 28 points, I think, for the Giants. You just couldn't keep him down. We give it to Eddie. And what does Eddie do with that uh, juke right there getting the first down? We call the timeout, and then we give it back to him. And another juke right there on the same guy. God, he got juked up twice. Twice in a row. 7.4 yards, 7 yards per carry. 40, uh, 40 rushes. Jesus Christ, I can't talk because I'm in such amazed shock by Eddie George's performance here. Whap! Right there like Chris Berman, but I'm not raising my voice like that. Touchdown. That's the end of the game. Well, that's not the end of the game. He gets the first down here, and you hear I'm going to raise the audio. They chant his name in Nashville, and that's the end of the game. Mercifully over a 49-28 ground game based shootout in Nashville that the Tennessee Titans end up winning. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. I am judging this guy, Joe Bush.